All right, everyone, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us and for being on time. I appreciate that. We'll go ahead and get started because I know that people have other things to do today. So I appreciate you joining us for this very last science of uh, animal myths today. So this is the last of the six week series that we started with, but we will do probably more. Um, I'll talk about that at the, at the end of the um, talk today, but we will talk a little bit more about um, some of the animal myths and different misconceptions and things that we hear a lot about that we might not know about or we might still wonder about or maybe they even are true. We'll, we'll talk about that today. So um, we will be recording today just so those that can't join us or those that had something come up can view this later on our online education page. And at the very end of the program, I'll type that in the chat box for you guys so you can find it as well. So um, my name is Monica McCubrey, and I am the Wildlife Education Specialist for the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. And today we're going to be talking about animal myths. Um, so I do also want to point out that I have you guys all on mute. And at the very end, um, we'll, I'll read through the chat box and we can discuss any questions or comments that you guys have. But otherwise, if you think of something, go ahead and put it in the chat box and we will definitely get to it closer to the end of the program. So. All right, we will go ahead and get started. All right, so what are animal myths? It could be something as much as a wives' tale, and a wives' tale you might hear of. Um, there are a lot of misconceptions. There are a lot of misunderstandings. There are exaggerations. There are superstitions. Um, oftentimes, and not always, but oftentimes it's about animals that people don't necessarily like, or they don't understand, or that they're scared of. Um, a lot of times it's about snakes, it's about spiders, um, lots of things that are kind of misunderstood or sometimes people fear a lot. So um, we'll talk a little bit about um, different ones in Nebraska today. So I don't have any exotic animal myths today. These are all ones that kind of have a hold in Nebraska just because these are the animals that we're out there seeing and I wanna make sure that people know um, about those animals instead. All right, so we're gonna talk about them. So, um, first one is about owls. So there is a myth out there that owls can actually turn their heads 360 degrees. So all the way around in a circle. Um, what do you guys think? Is it myth? Is it fact? It's actually a myth. So it is very seemingly that they can turn their heads almost all the way around. But if you think about it, if you turn your head all the way around, what happens? It would probably fall off. So that does not happen. Um, so the reality is that they can turn their heads quite far around. It's actually about a um, 270 degree motion. So close to a full circle, but not quite. Um, so it's limited to that 270 degrees in one direction. But if you think about it, if they could do 270 in each direction, that's 540 degrees range of motion for their entire head. To kind of give you a little bit about um, a starting point about where that is, humans, we have 70 degree motion for each time that we turn our head. So that's kind of puny compared to an owl. Um, so overall, we have 140 degree range of motion with our neck. Owls have 540 degrees. So um, this helps them find their prey. This helps them look around. And also, if you guys don't know, owls, their eyes are just so big, they actually can't move them in their head. They can't shift their eyes like we can. So if you guys stare at the camera screen really creep creepily, and you look to the left, you look to the right, we can move our eyes. Um, owls cannot do that. So that is why they have such a wide range of motion with their head. All right, this one was kind of fun. And if you've ever seen The Lion King, this is what kind of reminds me of it. Um, the very original Lion King, where the vultures are stalking Simba in, uh, after he runs away from his pride. But there's a myth that vultures um, will actually stalk living animals that they think are about to die. True, false, what do you think? It is false. So the vultures that we have in Nebraska, turkey vultures, they are the ones with the red kind of bald head. They eat dead things, we know that. So they eat something called carrion, so which is something that's already dead. They have an amazing sense of smell. Um, when you think about birds, they, they really don't have a good smell except for a few um, exceptions out there. Turkey vultures are one of them they have to be able to find their food. And that is one of the reasons that they have that amazing sense of smell. So they don't necessarily know when an animal is gonna die. No one really knows, um, but they are smart birds. They know where animals usually 
die. So if you think about it, um, it's areas with limited rainfall. Um, great instance, great example here is in the movie The Lion King when Simba's out in the desert and he's all by himself and there are all these vultures around him. Um, it kind of shows that th those are good places that animals might might die because there's no food, there's no water, there's not a lot of resources for them. It's hot and it's dry. Um, another area is by the road. If you think about it, a lot of animals die when they try to cross the road. So these animals are known to go to those areas because that is a lot of times where they're finding their food. So it's just kind of a, um, they're smart. They figure out where these animals are going to be and where they're going to get a good amount of food sources. And that is oftentimes why they hang out in those areas. All right. This is one of my favorites. Every time I do a reptile amphibian program, I have someone ask me if touching a toad or a frog is going to give you warts. And I always say, look at my hands. Do I have warts on them? I don't because I touch toads and frogs a lot, almost every single day. So there is a myth out there that says touching a toad, especially toads, um, will give you warts. So if you look at a picture of a toad, you see all these little bumps on their skin. A lot of times people think that those are warts. Um, that's kind of where this myth started. In reality, warts are caused by a human virus. They're not caused by frogs and toads. Um, so many frogs and toads have bumps on their skin, especially toads, because they are usually more terrestrial species. You're gonna find them in areas like gravel and sand and um, maybe in the prairie. These guys don't have to be as close to water as a frog does. So their skin is a little bit different and it's able to hold more water inside of their body than a frog does. So those bumps are just simple ways that the toad can hold in that moisture and people always think that if you touch them, you're gonna get warts. So basically those little bumps on their body are just for holding in water. However, a lot of toads um, right next to their um, back of their neck, they have these two little huge bumps that stick up. You can kind of see them here in the picture, right behind their eyes, and these are called paratoid glands. So what happens is that these um, oftentimes carry a bad tasting substance or a poison in them, depending on where you are in the world. Um, but in Nebraska, if for some reason, let's say your dog would get a hold of a toad and bit down on the toad, um, they're just gonna get a bad taste in their mouth and they're gonna drop it. And that is exactly what that toad wants you to do. It wants you to leave it alone and that's really its only defense strategy. Um, the toad or the dog might kind of foam at the mouth, but there's nothing that that toad is gonna give that dog that's gonna hurt it. So um, it's just one of their defense strategies, but no, they will not give you warts. All right, I saw some of these people, I saw some of you guys talk about this in the chat. Um, I get a lot of people that ask me this one as well, if possums hang by their tails. Um, partly true. So there's a myth out there that possums and a lot of movies show that possums will actually use their tails to hang by them and they'll just kind of hang there. Well, it's sort of true. So baby possums can actually hang on for a few seconds, um, but then an adult possum is way too heavy for their tail to hang on. So when you look at a possum and even in this picture, you can tell that their tail doesn't have a, a lot of hair on it and it's kind of naked, it's scaly, but they are what we call prehensile tails. So prehensile just simply means that they can grasp and hold on to things. So um, they can grab hold of branches and um, other like with their climbing across the fence line, they can grab onto the fence boards, but this is simply as a stabilizer. It's not to hold their body weight. So um, they don't hang by trees. They don't sit there and hang like a bat or anything like that. Um, so and even scientists have said, um, there's no point in them hanging around by their tail. I mean, what are they gonna do? Just sit there all day and hang around? So there's no real useful skill for them to have a tail that can hang on um, to hold their body weight. So they just simply don't do it. So it is a myth, partly true. All right, I also have a lot of people ask about this one as well. So will touching a baby bird make the mother reject it? Um, so there's a myth that mother birds will reject their baby birds if a human touches them. Or if you find a baby bird on the ground, you go to pick it up and you put it back in the nest, that's gonna make the mom not want it. So the reality is except for those few birds that we talked about earlier that have an amazing and incredible sense of smell, they don't even know if you touch their baby. So um, therefore, if you touch a baby bird, let's say, and you put it back in its nest or what you think it's its nest or a safe place, 
more than likely that mother is not even going to know that you touched that baby. They can't smell you, um, your scent on that baby bird. So um, mostly what happens is if you see a baby bird on the ground, the chances are that it's learning to fly. And oftentimes baby birds can sit there for two or three days on the ground while they develop their flight feathers and learn how to fly. So it's not uncommon that you're gonna see baby birds on the ground. It doesn't mean that they fell out of the nest or that they're hurt um, or that their mother left them or anything like that. Odds are that they are just kind of sitting there trying to learn how to fly and that the mom is very close. Um, so what we always tell people is if you see baby birds on the ground, normally just leave them alone. The mom is close by, she will feed them when you're not looking. Um, they're just learning how to fly. Unless the bird you see is in immediate danger or if it's um, very visibly injured, um, you can always call um, wildlife rehab or something like that. But most likely those birds are just sitting there on the ground trying to learn how to fly. So the mother will not reject them if you touch them. All right. So when doing this program and getting ready for it, when Google searching animal myths, mostly what comes up are bats. There's like five or six different myths out there that usually all relate to bats because they are one of those animals that people are scared of. They don't understand. There's not a lot of like all the time for bats. So there's a lot of misconceptions about these animals. One of the ones that I'm sure we've all heard is that bats are blind. So there's a myth out there that says they are blind, but in reality, yeah, they do have small eyes. Sometimes they're poorly developed, but they work just fine for the animal. So when we talk about bats, there's two different kinds. There's something called mega bats, which um, are mostly the bats that search for food. They use sight and smell. So they have to have good eyesight. These are not the bats that are gonna use echolocation. So for instance, if you go to South America and you find a fruit bat, they are not gonna use uh, echolocation to find their fruit. The fruit does not move. They don't need to do that. So they have to use their eyesight. Um, there's also something called micro bats, which we have here in Nebraska in the United States. These are the ones that mainly use echolocation to find their food. So they might have um, smaller eyes. They use them, they work just fine, but more than likely they are using um, echolocation to find those mosquitoes, to find those moths, to find whatever they're hunting. Um, looking at a bat eyes, they don't have the sharp vision like humans do. Um, usually when we talk about animals, animals usually have way better eyes than people do. This is not one of those cases. So they don't have the sharp um, images like we see and they are not, they don't have that color vision, but their eyesight works just fine for what they need it to do. They also work a little bit different than humans, so they can easily function in low light and sometimes even no light. In pitch black, they can still work just fine for those animals. So they are not blind. All right, I heard a couple people also in the chat talk about daddy long legs. So these are something I'm sure we see all the time. There's a lot of myths out there saying that they are the most venomous spiders, that they their fangs are too small, that you they can't inject their venom into you. Um, I've heard people say that they, um, there's a couple other myths I can't think of at the top of my head, but a lot of people say that they are the most venomous spiders, but their fangs are just too small. Well, the myth is that they are the most venomous spiders in the world. The reality is that dad, daddy long legs is actually a nickname, and they're usually given to these animals called harvestmen. So harvestmen actually have no venom glands. They aren't even spiders, but they are a different type of arachnid. So unlike spiders, they don't produce silk. They have no fangs. They have one main body part instead of two, but they are in the same family as arachnids. So um, these guys are not venomous. Um, the harvestmen that we're talking about, some people call different types of spiders daddy long legs, like the really long legged cellar spiders. Sometimes people refer to them as daddy long legs just because they don't, they don't know. Um, but when we talk about true daddy long legs, we're talking about harvestmen. And so they are arachnids, but they are not venomous. All right, um, if so, if you know me, you know that I like reptiles, especially snakes. So one thing I also hear when I do a lot of um, education animal presentations is that rattlesnakes will always rattle before they strike. So there's a myth that they will always rattle before they strike, but we all know that this is not true. Um, rattlesnakes are actually pretty shy and 
for the most part, they are harmless if they are undisturbed and if they are left alone. So the main reason that these guys have their rattles is it's a warning to let you know that they are close or that they are nearby. It basically is saying, don't step on me, back off. I just want you to know that this is my area. Do not come into it. Um, so a lot of people think that they will actually rattle their tails right before they strike. This is not true. Um, they don't always do that um, just because if there is a predator around, that's a great way to let their presence know that, hey, I'm here, that predator still might try and eat them. So my, most bites will happen when a rattlesnake is startled, harassed, or even picked up. Most of the time, if you're there and you walk by them, they will leave you alone. Um, most of the time when people get bit is because they are harassing the animal, they have startled the animal, they've stepped on it, they tried to pick it up and take a picture, all of these different things can happen. But not always will rattlesnakes rattle right before they bite. Um, there's also another myth that I didn't have on here, but uh, there's another one that says you can count the age of a rattlesnake by looking at the number of segments in the rattle. This is also a myth. So looking at that, we know that the rattle is actually made of the same stuff as your fingernails. So if anyone knows what that's called, it's called keratin. So it's just a special skin cell that's hardened and that is what that rattle is made out of. Well, just like your fingernails, you can break your fingernails. You can shave them down, you can clip them. There's lots of different things that make them smaller than if you just let them grow. So the same kind of thing with rattlesnakes, you can't tell the age because um, they might have broken off. They're, a predator might have gotten them. Um, there might have been a really hard year and there was not a lot of food, so they didn't grow as much as they usually do. So there's many different factors that change how tall or how big that rattle is. So it's not a good um, component when talking about age. All right, there's another one. There's a myth out there that people think that turtles can come out of their shell. A lot of different cartoons will actually show this, like if a turtle gets scared, they'll take off their shell and they'll run away or they'll pick up their shell like a dress and run away. Totally not true. Um, so turtles are completely attached to their shell. The shell grows with the turtle. So when the turtle is born, usually they're very small, depending on the species. But for instance, like a box turtle that we have here in Nebraska, they're going to be very tiny and about the size of a quarter and they will grow with their shell. So their shell, just like that rattlesnake, is made out of the same stuff your fingernails are made of, that keratin material. So just like you guys have to trim your fingernails when they grow, um, they grow with the shell. So the turtle um, is actually fused to a shell. And it's made out of about 50 different bones and the turtle's spine and rib cage are fused to that shell. So they cannot remove their shell even if they wanted to. Um, that's why a lot of the times if you guys ever see um, turtles on the road, if they've been hit before, it's a big deal if they break their shell because that is, that is their skeletal system for the most part. That's their spine, that's their rib cage. Um, so if something happens to that, something really bad is going to happen to that turtle. Um, another myth out there is that all species can retract their heads and legs into their shell. Most turtles can, but there are some out there, um, just like all other biological factors, there's all exceptions. Um, so there are exceptions that say that not all turtles can actually take their arms and legs and put them into their shell if they get scared. So, but for sure, they cannot take their shells off. All right, here's another snake one. I get this one a lot too. There's a couple here that we'll talk about, but they, I've heard people say that all snakes that swim are venomous. And this is not true. Um, in Nebraska, at least, we have two different types or we have one different type of snake called a northern water snake, which has the ability to look just like something called a water moccasin or a cotton mouth, um, which are found kind of in the southern part of the United States. Uh, we just don't have them here in Nebraska, we're just not the right climate for them. Um, but they look very similar to a venomous water moccasin or a cotton mouth. Um, they both swim in the water, they spend a lot of time near the water, um, the way that they swim is very similar, their banding and pattern is similar, um, but we just simply do not have, and I wanna repeat, do not have cottonmouths or water moccasins here in Nebraska. Um, so all snakes that swim, all snakes can swim. Um, a lot of times I hear people say that they, they get up on their kayaks or their canoes, or sometimes people will say that they get up on their boats and they've seen water moccasins. So if you think about it, when you swim, you get tired. I get really tired when I swim and sometimes I need a break. 
so their boat or your boat to them is like a little resting spot. They see this great little area, it's sunny, they can stop for a second, catch their breath, and then they can go back in the water. So a lot of people think that they're coming on board the boat to attack them or to scare them. They're simply just taking a little pit stop on a little rest. But um, just because they swim does not mean that they are venomous. All right. So there's another one out there. This one's talking a little bit about earthworms. So there's a myth that says cutting an earthworm in half, they will then regrow into two separate worms. This one is kind of partly true. Just hang on, it's partly true. So earthworms, when you look at their body, they have a distinctive head and a tail portion. Sometimes it's harder to tell the difference, but the tail I'm sorry, the head is going to be a little bit more pointy and it's going to move around a little bit more than the tail end of the worm. So the tail end can't grow a new head or other organs, but the head end is able to grow a new tail. So when you look at a worm, and you might be able to see it on this picture here, there's this little tiny band right here. It's called the clitellum. So what happens is that is where the um, the eggs are deposited. So um, if it is cut, if you cut an earthworm, and I'm not saying to go do this, but if you cut an earthworm around that band or right after that band, they say that that is the section that makes it grow. So if you cut it, the tail end can't grow a new head, but the head can grow a new tail end. So um, this is partly true, um, but again, it just depends on where the earthworm is cut, um, and it also depends on the age of the worm, if the worm is healthy, there's a lot of different things. The environment of the soil, there's a lot of different factors that depend on that. All right, this is my favorite. And I heard someone in the chat box also talk about this one. Um, I hear this one a lot. I hear a lot of people say that porcupines can shoot their quills if they get scared. Um, this one kind of makes me laugh because I just think about porcupines like shooting their quills out and it's just kind of ridiculous, but it does not happen. It's a myth. Um, so what happens, people think, is that when they get scared, they will actually shoot their quills and they can decide where they want to go. It doesn't happen. So what actually happens is when they get scared, they will erect them and just kind of make them stand up a little bit. So porcupines have over about 30,000 quills on their body. And usually, if you ever see a porcupine, they typically lay pretty flat. Um, if another if a male comes up when it's mating season or if a predator comes up to a porcupine or if you come up to a porcupine, um, they feel threatened or they feel scared or startled. They'll kind of leap to attention and they will erect their quills. So they'll make themselves look bigger than they normally are. They do not shoot their quills, but sometimes if um, a predator comes up and they get close and uh, what happens is they can actually detach quite easily um, from their skin. So they look very hard and menacing. Um, but they actually detach fairly easily. Um, if you've ever held a porcupine quill, they are keratin, the same exact stuff that a turtle shell, rattlesnake, and your fingernails are made of. It's just those specialized skin cells. They just look a little different. Um, so if you've ever looked at a quill, they have really sharp tips on them and they have overlapping barbs. So that's why if a dog or a cat or some other animal ever gets close enough to a porcupine, a lot of times you see them get caught in like their, especially dogs, um, they'll get caught in their uh, nose area or their muzzle area um, just because that's where they've been smelling them. They get stuck fairly easily because they're hard to take out. Um, normally what people say is you have to go into a vet to get them taken out because if you just pull them out, it's that, um, it's a barb, it's almost like a hook. So it, it can cause some serious damage if you try to do it yourself. All right, here's another bat myth out there. Bats will fly into your hair. Um, Anyone have a guess whether it's a myth or not? Hopefully you say right away, it's a myth. Um, so the myth is that bats love human hair. Uh, I don't know why they would like human hair, definitely not. Um, I don't wanna fly into your hair, a bat doesn't wanna fly into your hair. Um, a lot of the times people think that when they're flying around um, by your head, they, they wanna get caught in your hair. That, that doesn't even sound like a good idea. So a lot of the times when they're flying around, they get really close to you, it's more than likely they're trying to catch a mosquito, a bug, um, a moth, something around you, um, and they're just really fast. And it seems like they're flying at you, but they're really not. Um, so a lot of bat myths that are out there, they started when the whole Dracula scene came on. Um, great book, 
great old movie, but not necessarily great for bats. That's kind of where we get the whole bats will turn into vampires, uh, bats are blood suckers. Totally not true. Um, there are some that do, but there's, out of all the bats in the world, there's only two or three species that actually lap up blood. And they actually don't suck your blood, they just lap it up, but different story. Um, when bats fly around you, again, they're most likely going really fast to catch that insect. They, they know that you're there, but you're just an obstacle in their way. Um, I used to intern at the Omaha Zoo, and if you've ever been to the Kingdoms of the Night area, that really big area with the bats in it, um, I would get the really fun job, and I, when I say fun, I'm not being sarcastic, I really like this. I would go into the bat area and get to feed them. So I get the hip waders on, I get my bucket of fruit out there, and it kind of amazed me that all these bats, it was dark, I could barely see anything, and all these bats were flying around me, and not once did I have a bat run into me. Um, I had bats land on me, but again, they're resting, I'm a good obstacle, I'm tall, and I also have the food. So um, that is mostly why that they were um, flying into me and, and landing on me, but they never once got caught in my hair, they never ran into me because they couldn't see. So it was kind of amazing how they were able to do that. All right, this one. I always believed this myth for some reason, um, maybe because I used to not like spiders a lot, but I always used to believe that you did swallow eight spiders every year in your sleep. The reality is that it's highly unlikely that this happens. So when we talk about spiders in your house, um, normally there's gonna be about three or four really, really common species that live in North American homes. Granted, I know there's a lot more, but there's about three or four species, very, very, very commonly and often people are gonna see um, in their houses. But usually when they see them, they're around the webs or they're in non-human infested areas. They're, you're in your basement, they're behind your, um, the bucket of toys that you don't play with anymore. Like in our basement, we always see them around our washing machine and in the cracks and crevices there. So we don't go down there very often. So it's a great place for spiders to be. Um, basically, spiders have no interest in humans. We, we don't really do anything for them. We're bigger than they are. We're seen as a predator. They don't wanna be around us. So the last thing a spider wants to do is crawl into your mouth when you are sleeping. Um, also, if you think about it, if your mouth is open when you're sleeping, more than likely you are snoring, you are making noise. Um, if for some reason the spider does crawl on you when you're sleeping, it can feel the vibrations of you snoring, it can feel the vibrations of you breathing really heavily. Um, I know a lot of people when they get stuffed up or they have allergies, they will um, sleep with their, their mouth open because their nose is all stuffed up. You're making a lot of vibrations as far as your body goes. So they are not gonna wanna be around you. If you're loud, you're vibrating, they don't like that. Um, so the fact that a spider would actually want to crawl into your mouth is kind of a ridiculous concept. And I, I didn't know that until um, about five years ago. So I thought this one was really super interesting, uh, but you do not swallow spiders on the very, 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 very rare occasion that it does happen. It's a total accident, it's a total fluke. But you don't hear about that very often. All right, um, this one is more of an old wives tale. You might have heard about the woolly bear caterpillars, which um, we will start seeing now more um, in the fall when it comes time. They're the little brown and orange black caterpillars that you see. Um, they usually cross a lot of roads. Um, I always used to see them when I ride the Mopac Trail. They would cross the roads and I was always the nerd and stop and stare at them. But um, anyway, the amount of brown on the woolly bear caterpillars, they usually say that is a predictor of how severe the winter is going to be. So they say that the more black or the more orange is going to say, this is how bad the winter is going to be. So the reality is that there are many variables that contribute to the caterpillar's coloration. Um, it could be something like the temperature, how moist it was that year, um, the food availability for that animal. Um, was there anything that happened during the larval stage? So it is an old wives tale. Uh, people used to really believe in that. They used to think that um, they were able to tell how severe the winter was gonna be by just looking at their coloration. Turns out it's not true. Um, but what scientists have found is that it does tell something about the previous year. So it, they can kind of tell, um, looking at the coloring pattern, they can kind of see how 
severe the winter was beforehand because that tells them a lot about the food availability, the temperature, the moisture level. So if we did have a really bad winter and the animals are a certain color, we can kind of correlate that to the year before. But it really doesn't help us tell for, the, for this next year. All right, this is another one I hear about snakes a lot. Um, baby snakes can't control their venom. Um, or sometimes I hear people say that baby snakes are more venomous than adults because they don't have control of their venom yet. Um, so the reality is that adult snakes are just as dangerous, if not more dangerous than a baby. So, um, so baby snakes are born or young snakes are born with venom. Um, and then obviously as they get older, they have more increased amounts of venom because they're larger animals. Um, so some people say that babies can't really control how much if they do bite you um, or their venom is more concentrated because they are smaller, um, this isn't true. Um, so adults can actually have more venom than baby snakes just because they're older, they're bigger, they need more because they're bigger animals. Um, also, when snakes bite, not all bites are equal. So if a snake um, wants to, it doesn't have to um, release venom. It can do what we call a dry bite. Um, this is actually very common. So if a snake bites you, um, venom is expensive. Um, venom is really hard for them. Energy efficiency, they have to make a lot of venom and they don't, it's kind of their last resort. They use it for predators. Um, we know evolutionarily and adaptability that venom was mostly made for to aid in digestion and to help them um, swallow their prey. It's not necessarily as a first defense uh, mechanism, but now that they they have adapted it. They do use it sometimes for that. Um, but oftentimes when snakes bite, they sometimes will do a dry bite. So no venom is extracted when they bite you, um, but they can decide to release their venom if they choose. So, um, so no matter what, if you see a venomous snake and you know venomous snakes, leave them alone. All right, so this is another one I've heard. Um, I always used to believe this one too. Um, I always used to think that when you got a tick, uh, ticks will actually um, I never heard the jumping part, but I always heard that if you walk by a tree, you should go like this because snake or um, ticks will fall off of trees and land on your head. So this is totally false. Um, ticks do not have the ability to jump. They're physically unable to jump um, because of their body and because of their muscles. They, they just don't have any. Um, so ticks undergo what we call questing, which is an ambush strategy. Um, and this is how they find their next victim. So basically what they will do is they'll crawl up really high on a blade of grass, on a bush, something where they think that an animal is gonna walk by and they will use their back legs to anchor themselves onto this blade of grass or shrub or whatever they're looking at. And then when something walks by, they hang out their front feet and they grab onto something and immediately take off with that animal or with your sock or your shoe, whatever they grab onto. And then they will look for the heat, they can detect carbon dioxide levels, they want to find an area where they can be inconspicuous and, and attached to you. So they don't fall out of trees. They don't jump on you. Um, they just simply anchor themselves and then wait for something to walk by. All right. So we learned a lot about animal myths today. Um, many of these myths and misconceptions surround animals that people just don't know a lot about. If you remember throughout this presentation, we talked a lot about bats, insects, snakes. Um, these are things that people are normally scared of. Um, see, people don't like them, they've heard bad stories about them, they just simply don't know a lot about these animals. So the best thing that I always tell people is to just educate yourself. Um, it's super easy to do a Google. Um, when you look at something, you know, are bats blind? More than likely you're gonna get um, good resources that say they are not blind and here's why. Or bats do not fly in your hair and here's why. So there's a lot of people out there that are trying to educate people, um, but I always say if you are an educator and someone asks something and you don't know, just say, I don't know. Um, it's always better to say, I don't know, um, than to tell them something wrong. So um, you, won't look, um, you won't look like you don't know what you're talking about if you say, I don't know, but it's better than saying, yeah, ticks jump out of trees on you. So it's always good to tell people you don't know um, instead of saying something wrong. All right, so that was all of the um, Science Of series. We did six, uh, six weeks of this. So um, we are gonna do a new session or installment of them. And we have some new topics that are coming up. Um, we'll start September 3rd. 
So we do have some cool uh, topics that I'm really excited about. We're going to talk about plants. I heard a lot of people say that they're interested in plants. Um, so we're going to talk about wicked plants. So if you uh, know anything about plants, there are a lot of plants out there that are deadly. There's plants out there that you can eat. There's plants that you can get um, burns from if you touch. Um, invasive species, we're going to talk about animal headgear. We're going to talk about diseases. So lots of different topics. So be on the lookout. We'll do some press releases. We'll have more listserv emails. We'll do some Facebook events. So be on the lookout for those, but we will start September 3rd. And I just want to say thanks, everyone. This has been a really fun series. I have learned a ton of stuff by doing this. So I appreciate everyone coming every single week. I know Thursdays at three are sometimes hard to get to, but I appreciate everyone that has come. Um, so we'll check the chat box here to see if anyone has any questions. Hopefully. All right, and I will type the, um, if you guys did have someone that really wanted to watch this today and just didn't get a chance to do it, um, I will type in the address that you guys can go online, um, probably by tomorrow morning, this will be available. So if you have anyone that you wanna share this with, you can just direct them to this website. And then it's under the nature video tab. So every single one that we talk to will be under here. Um, and so if you missed the animal tongues one, or if you wanna talk about animal love that you missed last week, which was one of my favorite topics to talk about, that's on there as well. Um, but other than that, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, I'll stay on here for a couple more minutes. Otherwise, that's all I got. Thank you, everyone. I will stop sharing my screen too. Thank you guys. Fun program. Thank you. Very good. Love your webinar. Thank you guys. Appreciate everyone coming. And if you guys, I will probably be sending out a survey for you as well. So if you have any other topics that you want to see covered or if you're interested in something, um, I would love to know about it because I'm always looking for uh, might not necessarily be a science of series, but we could definitely do something else or we can cover that some way so that people can get that information. I'm glad that your black cat does not give you bad luck. My mom has a black cat too, and he is pretty sweet. All right, if there's any other questions, I will stay on maybe one more minute. And if you guys don't have any more, or do have more questions that you think of later, I will go ahead and type my email in here, and you can always email me as well. Otherwise, I will get this recording up and we it'll be available probably by tomorrow to view. All right. I appreciate it, guys. Thank you, everyone, for coming.